So these spark gap transmitters in the early 20th century were completely ubiquitous. They could transmit vast distances. For example, there was a spark gap transmitter on board the Titanic when it sent its distress call. The early pioneers of the spark gap transmitter also became famous for their work. For example, Marconi received the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1909 along with Karl Braun for his work on the radio telegraph. But he worked on many different alternative designs for transmitters and receivers too. And Marconi was born in 1874 and he passed away in 1937. Interestingly, he was a member of the Italian Fascist Party. But he died before the end of World War II, so he was unable to see how it all turned out. Now, the Marconi Company, which he formed, was eventually sold in 2003 to Ericsson. So I suppose now it's folded into Sony Ericsson. Let's now listen to how one of these spark gap transmitters would have sounded to a radio telegraph operator wearing the headphones. As we look back at the voltage across capacitor C1, we see that the sparks occur periodically. Now how often these sparks occur depends on how long it takes to recharge capacitor C1 after the tank circuit has been depleted and capacitor C2 has been discharged. So you can very easily control the sparking frequency by adjusting the values of R and C1. So now let's listen to the audio clip in Morse code of a spark gap transmitter where it's been designed so that we get 60 sparks per second. What you're going to hear in Morse code is CQDEPN. Now let's listen to an alternative version of a spark gap transmitter where the sparking frequency is 125 sparks per second. You're hearing now CQDEPO. So I'm sure you've noticed that there was an obvious difference in the way these two spark gap transmitters sounded. You were hearing the sparking frequency. I mentioned that Marconi spent some time working on ticker tape machines because there's more than one way of receiving the signal from a Morse code generator or a telegraph. One way is to just listen to it, but another way would be to use a ticker tape machine. So if the transmitter is turned on, the stylus goes down. If the transmitter is off, the stylus comes up. So if you run a small piece of paper under the stylus, then you can print or punch holes. And then somebody who's skilled in reading Morse code with the eye would then be able to interpret what was being transmitted. So this is the origin of the ticker tape machine. And this is also one of the origins of the stock symbol. Because when stock exchanges were transmitting data from one point to another, they obviously wanted to save paper. So it makes sense to represent the name of a company using as few characters as possible. So then when it's transmitted in Morse code and it comes out onto a sheet of paper, we don't end up wasting a lot. But in the early 20th century, companies did waste a lot of paper and this gave rise to the ticker tape parade. I'm showing here a photograph of the ticker tape parade, which took place in 1969 to honor the Apollo 11 astronauts when they got back from the moon. Now in 1969, Morse code telegraph style ticker tape was probably not being used anymore. So I would assume that they're just throwing other waste paper from their offices out the windows in that photograph. 